Thank you and welcome. This is the Education Committee in the Vermont House of Representatives. And today we are uh, looking at Act One, some requests from the Act One work group. And we thought we would start today. Um, this is our um, uh, ethnic, uh, ethnic Studies and Social Equity work group. And I thought what we do is start with um, uh, Jim Damaray just presenting to us what Act One, so we can have a better understanding for the people who weren't here of what the mission was in, in Act One. And then we're going to hear um, a little bit of report from the, from the work group and go from there. So, Jim Damaray, thank you. Okay, good morning. Um, so, for the record, uh, Jim Damaray, that's Consul. Uh, can I share the screen? I can't. Great. Thank you, Jesse. Um, let's find Act One for you. Okay. So here is Act One, which was passed in 2019. Um, I'm going to start at the end, actually, uh, and then Thank go you. back. Because at the end, it's really um, all the work that's been done has a result. Um, and that result is back somewhere in here. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay, that's it. Sorry, I'm just trying to find out where the state board. Okay, here it is. Okay, right here on I. So, um, We'll go through the the, the duties of, of the um, of the group, um, but before doing that, just the result of their work. Um, so they're going to make a recommendation to the state board before June 30 of next year um, around um, ethnic and social equity uh, study standards. So the idea is that they're going to present to the state board a set of standards. Uh, which take into account perspectives of historically marginal, marginalized groups. Um, and this, the state board will cons consider that um, and uh, will consider uh, adopting that into its standards that will drive the curriculum in schools. So a couple of things about this. Uh, first is the state board is not required to act um, it's a may in terms of their, um, their duties here. They, they shall consider, but they don't have to act um, on this report. Um, but the report is all about um, updating standards for marginalized students that would drive the curriculum in schools. So that's the end result of the work here. So let's go back now and take a look at what they're actually supposed to do. I'll go back to the beginning and just highlight who they are. Um, I won't go through the find, findings, um, um, but I will go through. Um, yeah, so first of all, definitions are important here. Um, a lot of discussion when this was enacted about this definition here about ethnic groups. Uh, so just to remi remind the members that. Uh, ethnic groups me means non-dominant racial and ethnic groups in, in the U.S., including people who are Abenaki, people from other indigenous groups, people of African, Asian, Pacific Island, uh, Taconix, Latinx, or Middle Eastern descent, and B, groups that have been historically subject to per persecution or genocide. Um, and then ethnic studies means uh, instruction of students in pre-K to grade 12 in the historic contributions and perspectives of ethnic and social groups. So we just talked about ethnic groups. We're gonna come on to social groups right here. Uh, means uh, women and girls, people with disabilities, immigrants, refugees, and individuals who are lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, questioning, intersex, asexual or non-binary. Non so this um, ethnic studies, as we talk about, encompasses both the, the definition of ethnic groups and social groups. Um, it was uh, the 
C creates the uh, advisory working group uh, of 20 members. It won't go through all these members, but you have 10 members who represent the interest of ethnic and social groups, two of whom should be high school students. Um, and then you have uh, the Bs, of course. Um, you've got uh, a Vermont College faculty expert in ethics studies. Um, you have the Curriculum Leaders Association. Um, okay, and you get the Human Rights Commission. Um, the way in which the 10 members were appointed um, who represent the ethnic groups, the social groups, uh, was by the uh, Coalition for Ethnic and Social Equity, Equity in Schools. Uh, so the coalition is the one who chose these appointments. Um, the working group had to represent the breadth and geographical area within the state. Um, and uh, so the rest of this right here is quite standard. I'll go on to the um, duties here. Um, so the duties of the working group are first to review standards for student performance adopted by the state board and uh, to recommend to the state board updates and additional standards to recognize these marginalized groups. Um, so again, it's around standards, um, not around curriculum, uh, which is done at the local level. And the recommendations, um, uh, would be designed to increase cultural competency of students, um, increase attention to the history, contribution, and perspectives of these groups, uh, promote critical thinking, uh, commit the school to eradicating a racial bias in curriculum, uh, provide um, content and methods to, to enable students to safely explore these areas uh, uh, and to ensure that the basic curriculum and extracurricular programs are welcoming to all students. Um, okay, so uh, the working group second duty is to review statutes, board rules, and school district and supervisory union policies that concern or impact standards for student performance or curriculum use in school. Um, and then there's a permission to uh, recommend to you uh, Post-statutory changes with these goals in mind. I won't go through them all, but very similar to the goals above. Um, so I won't go through them again. Um, and then the working group has to uh, report to you um, of any policy that identifies a deem review or amendment in order to achieve these goals here. I won't go through them all again, but these are all goals in line with promoting um, uh, the historical contributions and culture, et cetera, of these historically marginalized groups and getting children to uh, appreciate uh, that. Uh, then the, the um, group has to do reports. So uh, the, this is a past report for May, March 1, 2020. Uh, then they have a report that was due December 15, 2020. Um, and now we're up to this one here, three, the report due next July, uh, which will include um, recommended statutory changes, uh, any further findings for its review of, of state board rules and school district and supervisory union policies, and any recommendations for training and appropriations to support implementation. Um, and then again, we talked about the duties of the state board. So when it's all done, um, they'll give the state board the recommendations and the state board will consider them in terms of updating its standards. Um, and then section two amended the state board's general powers and duties. Uh, um, uh, so it's reporting on a supervisory union and school district basis. And what's being reported here is more, I believe, detailed here. So uh, it says it's consistent with state and federal privacy laws and regulations on, um, it says that hazing, harassment, or bullying incidents shall be disaggregated by incident type. And again, by ethnic groups, um, et cetera. So uh, more detail there. Um, and that is about 
it for what I think I have to say on this. Um, so should I keep this open to web or should I close this document for you? Um, why don't we close it so that I can see everybody? Okay. So I wanted to give folks that perspective um, since um, there were, I think, three of us that were here. No, there were more than that. That's right. There are four new, four new folks to that bill. Um, Representative Cooperly, did you have something? No, okay. So with that context, um, if there are any, aren't any questions about that, I'd like to go on to our, to our guests. So welcome, Amanda Garces. Thank you so much, um, Chair Webb and members of the committee. My name is Amanda Garces. I am the Director of Policy Education and Outreach for the Vermont Human Rights Commission. And I am also the chair of the Act One Working Group. Um, so, so happy to see you again. And we are at it again. Um, so yeah, I think just for members that are new, just I want to just start by um, really just highlighting the existence of Act One and all of it, all of our, you know, the history and background is in in the Act One bill, but. Just to remind ourselves, I always copy, you know, like I always have the green book with me everywhere I go, just to remind ourselves that not, not long ago, 20 years ago in 1999, um, the Vermont Advisory Committee to the United States Commission on Civil Rights found that racism in Vermont schools was pervasive. Um, that a follow-up report in 2003 said, yes, some changes have been made. That was a progress report but you know, it still have a lot of problems and curriculum it was one of the issues that were talked about um, around um, bias. Um, and Act 54, which passed, which, you know, a report that was done by the Human Rights Commissions um, in 2017, I believe, um, also talked about education and the need for a, a bias-free curriculum. And then we have all kinds of statistics, including uh, the fact that students with disabilities and uh, black and brown students were disproportionately impacted by policies, discipline policies in our schools. So all of that was all of those reports and kind of lead to the creation of the Act One Working Group. Um, in 2019. So today, um, so we started the working group of four months behind the schedule. Uh, we didn't have our first meeting until December 2020. Um, and we have been playing catch up to, you know, we still made our reports, I think, you know, like maybe just a month after. Um, but all of our reports up to now have, have been uh, made. Um, and I guess we are here for a few things. One is to really ask for the support for the addition of three additional members, which is a request we made um, last year before COVID started and we had to go into COVID mode. Um, but we really feel that we need two more student voices in our working group. Uh, we've known that from the beginning of the work. Um, we have amazing students that are giving us really great contributions, um, but they requested that in the first meeting, we need more student voices and we wanna honor that. We also feel that we do um, need, and it was a request made by the indigenous communities, by you know our Abenaki, um, that we needed to have one more indigenous representation. So we're asking today to kind of honor the work and bring in those three more voices that can support the work. Um, that will mean that we need, it's like $1,500 a year for stipends. Um, as the statute says, we, you know, we get um, those members who are not requesting is like $50 a month, $50 per meeting up to 10 meetings a year is what um, the request is made. So when uh, we ask the agency of education, it's about $1,500 per member. So it's $4,500. Um, and appropriations for that. So that, that, that was one of the requests that we have today. Um, in the we just submitted a report in January of, two, of this year. 
uh, which included a uh, request for appropriation for, I believe it was $118,000. And I'm gonna go over um, a change in, that, in those numbers and just like give you a little report and Mark is here. Um, it, can Mark introduce himself so people know that who Mark is so that we can talk to him? Good morning all, I, I'm Mark Hage. I'm the vice chair of the Act One Working Group. Thank you, Mark. We have not had you in this year, so welcome. Well, thank you, it's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, anyway, the two of you wanna do it, it's fine. Great. Um, Mark, do you wanna add something before I jump into other things? Sure, just a little more context. Um, Amanda has kicked this off very nicely. In February of 2020, um, before COVID um, changed our world, um, the Act One Working Group, through a dedicated subcommittee, drafted, conceptualized, and drafted a very comprehensive survey that we disseminated to educators around the state to get their impressions um, and their working experience with our state educational standards. Um, we are now in the process of studying those results. We also then shifted to a very intensive focus on the education quality standards, EQS for short, which no doubt you are familiar with. Um, that is really sort of the foundation of um, our education system here in Vermont. So much flows from it. So we devoted several months worth of work to that effort as well. And we have submitted um, a series of recommendations for changes to the State Board of Education. And that work is ongoing as well. And last summer, um, we reached out, Amanda and I, to the College of Ethnic Studies at San Francisco State University. It is the oldest College of Ethnic Studies in the United States. It's been in existence for nearly 52 years. There are only two Colleges of Ethnic Studies in the United States. Uh, they are both in um, California. The second opened re recently or was formed recently is Cal State Los Angeles. There are a lot of colleges that offer courses and programs in ethnic studies, but only two that have colleges dedicated to this work. And we reached out to San Francisco because it really is um, sort of the, the pinnacle, the paragon of ethnic studies in the United States. And we have made contact with two of the leading scholars and teachers in this field who are interested in working with us in the next stage of our work, which is probably the most critical. And that is addressing the standards, analyzing them and reporting to you and to the State Board of Education. And that's what we'll talk a little bit more after Amanda finishes her remarks. So I also want to add that you know, there's a lot of conversation in our state around curriculum bias and how that is impacting a lot of students. And so this is why this work is important. Educational standards, so our work is not to write or draft any curriculum. Our work, and I just, it's our educational standards, which is the learning goals for what students should know and be able to do at each grade level. And so um, this is why this is so critical. Educational standards, um, you know, allowed for local communities and educators to write their own curriculum, which is a detailed plan for the day-to-day -day teaching. Um, so we, that has been, that is our focus and that's what we're trying to do. So Mark and I leading this, this, this group um, have been learning a lot and, and trying to figure out, but at this point right now, we're kind of at the crossroads. So to the education quality standards kind of opens the door for a lot of things. And we started kind of reviewing some of the standards and we kind of hit a wall part because we don't have the expertise in our working group or capacity or time. Um, there is no current funding um, for even administration. So we are doing it all and we are really grateful to be able to do this work, but capacity is very limited for, for all of our members, right? And everybody's giving what they can. So we are at a crossroad where we don't feel um, that we can do or that we should do just a okay job. We feel like this has such an impact to our schools, to our state, that we need to do it right. And by right means we need to bring the right level of expertise to support us in um, really helping us build a framework 
for questioning the standards the way that they need to be questioned. Um, and, and this is why we had been talking with the community response uh, education, community responsive education in San Francisco, which are led by the ethnic studies professors. And Mark can talk a little bit about that. Sure, so the community responsiveness education program is affiliated with San Francisco State University's College of Ethnic Studies. And one of the things that's really exciting about working with them is that the people who founded the program, who lead it, they're not only scholars and researchers who are respected in their field, but they're also teachers. And they provide, per, per, excuse me, professional and curriculum development expertise to public schools, to teachers, to community groups. Their goal is to make public schools as responsive to the needs of everyone in our community as they should be. And we want the schoolhouses of the future to be places where all of our youth, all of their parents, all of their cultural heritages and groups are respected, are free from any kind of discrimination and persecution, can achieve their potential. And this is what CRE focuses on. And this work of the standards is really the foundation of what comes next. And they are actually excited about working with us because A, we are a state with an overwhelmingly white population. They are traditionally people who work in communities with a much higher percentage of BIPOC individuals and students and communities. And they see the work that we're doing here in Act One as a very exciting opportunity and an innovative one to expand the scope of ethnic studies and to begin looking at how ethnic studies can be foundational to the work of schools here in Vermont, as well as anywhere else in the United States. And what really excites me about the folks we've been talking to is that, again, they're not just researchers and scholars, which is critical and respected in their field, but they're on the ground. They're working in schools and they're working with community groups. And that is really the heart and soul of the coalition that started this work, of the Act One Working Group, we're not looking for them to do our work. I want to be really clear about this. Amanda and I in the Act One Working Group and Susanna, we will do this work, but we need their guidance and expertise to help us to structure it, to point us to where we need to focus our energies. Where are we strong in the standards? Where are we deficient in the standards? How can they be improved? And how can we make education as effective as possible in Vermont? We need them as guides, as experts, as Amanda said. And with that, we're convinced that we can do this work ourselves, just as we've done already with the EQS and with our survey. Thank you. When do you expect the survey to be, to be complete? We are analyzing it now. So we had about 298 um, respondents, which is... Was, they, was it... Um educational personnel, was it teachers or? It, it, this survey was just for, edu yeah, it's for it, teachers, their staff of school districts. Yeah, okay, great. Um, uh, and Susana's here too. So Susana wants to jump in. She's also part of the working yes, group. Yes, so. and I know she has a time. Uh, okay. End time. So thank you so much for joining us as well. Um, Dr. Davis, appreciate having you here. Um, and you've been you've been in Vermont now for about a year, is it? Uh, coming up on two years. Two years. Well, we yeah. have one year that kind of blew up on us. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, we did. Um, but I, I don't think there was anywhere I would have rather been than than here. So I was grateful for that. Thank uh, you. Well, for the record, Susanna Davis, Racial Equity Director. Uh, I am not a doctor. <laughs> um, I just I just play one in the pavilion. And, I think um, we just dispensed degrees here since we are the education committee. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll, I'll, we'll take it. <laughs> okay. um, and, you know, I really, I don't have a whole lot to add, actually. I think that Amanda and Mark have done a great job of laying out where the, where the group is, um, the fact that there is so much passion and expertise in the room and so much momentum. We've identified real clear need that can help us accomplish the goals, not just those as stated in the enabling statute, but also those that we've set for ourselves and that we'd like to see accomplished for schools across the state. Um, but I think, I mean, of course, you all know that investment, especially in something like education and especially in something like equity, 
it is continuous and um, you know for us to for us to do the work and take the work seriously we've got to continue to to support it and in some cases that means um, reviewing how we resource it every now and then to ensure that we're providing adequate support um, and in other cases it might mean revising um, goals missions etc so I, I really just want to echo what uh, what Mark and Amanda have said I think they've done a wonderful job leading this group as far as we've come um, given our our capacities our timelines etc and for us to enter the next phase of that work um, this is really an exercise in in entrusting the community and trusting the subject matter experts to to let us as state leaders know what they need or what we need um, in order to proceed further in a way that's that's going to serve the you know the spirit of the statute and also actually make a difference so um, I guess that was a really roundabout way of saying ditto to everything that was already said and um, yeah, I, I again, I, I just I have very strong and very positive feelings about the outcomes we can accomplish here, um, and I just want to make sure that we're we're cradling this work uh, as much as possible. So um, the committee has already had conversation about adding um, adding members, um, student members, and I, I think that that does not look like it's a problem at all from from recent experience conversations we have struggled a little bit with the idea of the appropriation going through in this way um primarily because this isn't a group that appropriates and and um also that this is part should be part of professional development within within districts and I, I believe we have someone from the from the AOE here as well and that's not to say that this isn't a great idea but maybe this is the wrong train to put that on maybe there's another another place that that we could address this and I'm not clear about that yet hoping we can get a little bit of help from the agency on that um, and uh, I see representative James has a question Thank you, Chair Webb, um, and thanks to you for being here today. Um, I Just to refresh my memory, um, I thought there were two sort of distinct appropriation requests, and I could be wrong, but I thought one request was to hire a consultant um, to guide or, or support the um, working group as we've just been discussing, and then separately there was an appropriation request to send teachers out to San Francisco State. And I view those two appropriations kind of differently. Um, so am I, am I uh, wrong about that? Correct, um, you are correct. And, um, and, and so after we testified and all of that, so we, we end with me meeting with a community response team and just like asking other consultants, uh, we, figure out that 25,000 is not going to get us too far either. So um, we wanted to request a little change in the appropriation. So we had requested 25,000 for the consultant. We had requested 10,000 for accessibility issues. So as you know, any of these documents, state board policies are jargony. So, you know, uh, that um, the general public doesn't really, you know, as, as a parent trying to understand the standards for our kids, all of that. We want this work to really be comprehensive and we need to be able to make it accessible for the communities to understand what the process is going through so that we can get their feedback. We wanna be able to make this information accessible for our working group members who are from the community, some who have requested this in, in terms of the accessibility issue. Um, so we uh, need a 10,000 to hire someone that can help us with the accessibility issue. There are many experts in the state, many that work with some of the disability rights organizations that do this beautiful work um, that can support that piece of it. Um, so that was an appropriation for 10 plus. So then, and then it was, this is outside from the teacher training. Um, and then another 5,000, which included the appropriations for the three members and then 500 for the admin. Right now, I'm paying out of pocket for the survey monkey for him, for example, um, and that's like thirty-five dollars a month. Um, that that you know that, that it should be covered by this work, not by me. 
Um, so the that so that and then so we just don't think twenty five thousand is gonna be enough. Uh, we did have a lot of conversations about how maybe we can do a workaround with the teacher program um, and like have them and have us work with San Francisco State to try to figure out which teachers could go with their own PD money or try to find some other way. So today we are uh, changing that request to be 50,000 for the consultant, uh, plus the 10,000 for accessibility, plus the 1,500, the 5,000 that includes the membership and then technology fees. So Amanda, that's 65,000, I'm sorry. Is, is this something that could be addressed just by giving you more support from the agency? The standards work, I don't believe, can be addressed that way. I, I think we do need the resources of the experts we spoke to earlier. Yes, I, 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 I don't think um, that. And the 10,000 with accessibility, I'm not sure if the if the AOE, that's a question for the AOE, if they have the staff to support actually making all these documents accessible. But if they did have that staff. Yeah. That, that would be great. Be, that course. would be the appropriate. Yeah. Uh, that, that would be great. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I don't see other questions. If that is it, I'll go on to just a careless. Um, we don't see anything at the moment, so. Stay with us. And just to Carolus, I believe I saw you here. I'm here. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Hi, Hi Jess. Uh, for, for the record, I'm Jess Carolus, uh, Division Director of the Student Pathways Division of the Agency of Education. And um, I'm, I'm happy to be here. I know that there was some scrambling at the last minute um, with some schedule changes. You know, and my understanding is that Secretary French has already uh, testified to this and spoken to Chair Webb. And I'm not sure if the agency's uh, position on the bill has changed, but I think I can sort of speak to some of the, the issues that have been raised and particularly questions around where the agency can support um, the group. Uh, you know, uh, my colleagues, Amanda and Mark and Susanna, you know, I, I know well, and Amanda and Susanna sit on a task force to diversify the educator workforce at the agency has been supporting for a couple years. So obviously the agency completely supports the work of, of this group um, and uh, absolutely agrees that this is work that needs to be done. I do think that there's opportunity for more involvement and um, collaboration with the agency. I, you know, I know my, my team stands ready and, and I think I, I, Amanda's invitation was able to work with the the work group once, um, and we were able to road test a tool that I think they spoke to in their report. Um, but certainly, you know, particularly in looking at some of the recommendations they've made around revisions to the education quality standards, it's it's in no way, um, you know, uh, contrary to any of the work that we've been engaged in um, as we've been working in parallel with the, the work group. So certainly when it comes to accessibility, this is something that the agency has expertise in. Um, not only do we have to follow federal regulations that are fairly restrictive that um, exceed probably what most people have to comply with when it comes to communications, and we have trained um, web liaisons throughout the agency, as well as our communication director um, who can speak to this, and, and that's something we have to do. Uh, and in fact, if we don't do, we get our hands slapped by the federal government. So uh, this is something that we actually, I think, are well positioned to address. Obviously, we also have teams devoted. We have the special education team, the MTSS team. We have folks who are responsible for titles and have expertise in English language learners, et cetera. So that, that's work that we've been doing for a long time and, and certainly can assist with, uh, as well as also helping folks with the technical components of policy and, and rules, et cetera. Um, you know, I, I think with the standards work, I might disagree with Mark in the sense that we do have people who are well positioned and who've been engaged in this work who could be providing more assistance. We've actually been engaged in work around equity literacy, um, equity literacy grants. Um, we have a round that went out in 2019. We've just launched another round of proposals around developing inclusive communities and education equitable, equitable education systems. Um, but I, I think also in looking at some of 
you know, when we look at law, right, which is sort of the, the biggest, most global bucket, and then we go down to rules, which is what this um, group has been engaged in, and that's like sort of the second tier of the education quality standards. These are really rough tools, and then you start to get into uh, specific content standards. You start to get into policy and practice, and so we've also been, as this group was working on the education quality standards, have in parallel been addressing issues related to uh, you know, how do you implement and how do you practice this and how do you refine your proficiency-based graduation requirements? How do we develop tools? And we've started to launch these uh, equity spotlights on uh, particular proficiency-based graduation requirements as they pertain to specific disciplines and standards with corresponding resources that we're rolling out. And I, I'd love to start to bring the two pieces of work together um, so that we can start to scale these efforts I do think that, you know, from the perspective of supporting professional learning, we know that there is an enormous amount of money coming into the state and particularly to the locals, uh, as in addition to some of the state grants that we have available around this work and, and particularly in engaging professional learning, but also interrogating curriculum and starting to engage in that refining, revising, curricular work that we think is important, um, particularly when it comes to then practice in the classroom, uh, because certainly the one of the greatest influences is that when somebody goes into the classroom and closes the door, at some point, it, it doesn't really matter what the standards, and particularly those big bucket standards, you can have people who engage in enormous um, and effective uh, instruction that is inclusive and respectful, and you can, with those same standards, have someone make curricular choices that result in harm. And so I, I think, you know, exploring how we can provide guidance to locals to use the funds that they have available um, to support some of that professional learning and that curriculum redesign is an effective strategy that's worth exploring. So our schools have an extra 400 million coming to them as a result of the 400 million federal funds. Yeah, and, and I think as, a, as an interesting thought point, I know the Learning Policy Institute had, had put out some um, work around, you know, what, what do these funds mean? And, and even identifying that one major lever that these funds can be used for is diversifying the educator workforce, right? So there is there, how these funds can be used and not seeing these things as separate initiatives, but really in thinking about how we engage in recovery work is the opportunity to think about redesign and achieving the goals of, you know, a fair and equitable education system that serves all students and starting to address these issues with the guidance of the, the work group who's, who's already done exceptional work. So do you have a recommendation on, on what we can do to, to support? It sounds like there's some alignment in some of the thinking, but not necessarily the, the, the way to get there. Yeah, well, you know, and, and I, might, I might be misperceiving this, so I would yeah. ask, you know, Mark and Amanda and Susanna to correct me, but, you know, in reading the report, it sounds like definitely there's just more work to do, right? Um, COVID threw a wrench on everyone, right? And so really they've uh, been taking this very, um, you know, thoughtful, reflective approach to the revision and that that revision process hasn't ended, that it needs to be completed. And I think seeing that go forward and continue to complete it, but perhaps with some additional um, support or collaboration with the agency. Um, and I, I know my, my content standards folks are, are sort of chomping at the bit and would, would love to be working with this group. You know, that might be a, a first step also as we're seeing how some of the funding issues that are coming in sugar out. And, and again, I would just offer up that we can absolutely support, you know, that technical guidance piece that, that was outlined in the bill. Representative James. Um, thanks. You know, I, I'm glad to hear that AOE can help with um, some of the technical uh, stuff. You know, I just want to um, put in a pitch for um, the concept of uh, tapping into the consulting expertise of um, San Francisco, is it San Francisco State? Sorry. I, you know, I just, um, 
this bill is so important and this work is so important and the final report is so important. And, you know, however we wind up um, recommending that the State Board of Ed um, revise our, our standards is just, it, you know, really, really matters. And um, so to the thought of the AOE um, really getting engaged in this work, um, I would say yes and. Um, you know, it's unless I'm misunderstanding the funding request, I, you know, I was, I was less um, supportive of the idea of sending 30 teachers out because I felt like that was something that should be contained maybe in the final report, you know, and we think we should do this. But in terms of tapping into what sounds like really unique expertise, um, you know, from an outside source, I, I don't see why the AOE and the task force's collaboration can't be um, informed by that in a really unique, um, you know, I don't want to say once in a lifetime chance, but th this is a big deal. And if we have um, experts um, who can help, um, I, I would be really supportive of that, especially if it's at the level of 50,000. 50, why would we not want to bring that voice into the conversation? Representative Austin. Yes, thank you. Um, I just want to uh, say, and I think uh, Representative Brady, Rep Representative Webb, we've worked in schools. You know, I've worked in schools where the AOE or other great ideas, wonderful ideas, um, the intent was there, but the implementation uh, was not well thought out. Um, and I want this to work just like uh, Representative James does. Um, and I want the implementation, even if it takes time to be really well thought out, I want teachers to have a voice in this, Vermont teachers. And I'm really glad about the survey because I'm curious, I'm very interested to see what the results are from teachers as to what some teachers are doing now, what some teachers would like help with. But I think that's a huge component before we bring in uh, someone from the West Coast. I'm very concerned about bringing in um, expertise from San Francisco. That is a really different environment if you, real, if you read how much pushback now um, there is to ethnic studies um, entering the California school system. Um, it's, it's concerning to me in terms of uh, the public response to uh, that, the way it's being implemented and some of the content. So I would be really hesitant to, uh, to work with, you know, to at this point to have anybody come in. I would love a consultant. I totally support a consultant who knows Vermont or at least knows New England um, to work with you on ethics. Do you have a question too, Representative Austin? Um, question? Yes. Uh, my question is uh, how you're going to use the survey uh, to inform your work and um, how you're going to involve Vermont teachers in this conversation in terms of what questions they have, you know, what support they would like, you know, what their thoughts are, because I think they're a big uh, component of this that that needs to be included. I, I think that um, and I, first I have a few things about the last question. I think that this work the way that we think of this work, it's not, we are not the experts, the experts are the community. And we're not just looking at teachers, we, we're looking at parents and we're looking at students. Um, the Students Against Racism just did a survey, 290 students, um, 97 students that asked the question about how schools are engaging around race. And there's not many, if you haven't seen that report, I will ask Addie to send it to you. Um, because it's, it's, it's a really great little survey that talks about how race and those conversations are happening in the school from the school perspective. 
Now on the other side, um, the coalition who, who kind of let this work, um, who I am a member of, but who are not, I'm not as involved as I used to be, um, the, they're doing really great work. And they're doing a lot of this work ties in with Act One. They've done two educational events in the past two months where they had about 70, about 50 of them are teachers from Vermont schools that are part of all these conversations. So I think that to think that this work can happen without the voices of the people, it's not, it's not gonna be the work. And that's what, this is why this work is so important because it is really, we always have seen and we have talked about Act One being a loop mechanism for all the work that is happening on the ground. So we don't think that we are speaking for teachers. We are hoping for their voices. That's number one. Number two, because we are a very white state and people who do ethnic studies and don't have the lived experience are not gonna be able to help us guide this work well, which is why we wanna work with San Francisco State. These are all BIPOC people, people with disabilities, people that work in all of this from a lived experience, which is very, very different which is why Act One exists, to bring the voices of the people who have been formed by the systems for too long. These 11 members who are from the community are people who are in touch with all of that work. So having the work, the, I think the backlash in the San Francisco states, are very different conversations. They're not looking at standards, they develop curriculum. Um, and a lot of the backlash goes to the Palestinian conversation. So I think like we need to be thoughtful about when we are comparing that work, what is happening there. Um, and many of the members, yes, they, they, they did all this work, again, from the lived experience of the people. Um, so how we're going to be using this result, the result of the survey, it's, not, it's only 297 teachers who didn't collect uh, regional information around who the teachers are. It was an anonymous conversations. And we, it's just a little glimpse about what we can do. We've talked about focus groups, all of that, that requires funding and money to do the work well, right? So here we are again, San Francisco State is like the, the folks from that were asking for the support of the community response team is not to do the work for us. We have the lived experience. We have the community. We want their expertise to help us frame how we will tackle um, the, uh, the standards. So M Mark, I know you have things to add about that. Oh, I, I think you covered that very nicely. Okay. And I want to, I want to, um, I know that I see Jess, I think has a response to an earlier piece. So I'd like to, I'd like to go to Jeff. Yeah, it, you know, I, I think I just wanted to, and I put a, uh, several links um, in the chat, um, but certainly can follow up and send some organized work because I know it sort of runs into itself when it's in the chat. But, you know, I, I just want to surface too that there are, there is work underway and that there are resources and, you um, supports that are available right now, you know, whether that's in addition to what's being recommended. And, and certainly I think our, our participation in the New England Secondary Schools Consortium where we're working with our New England states. And as an example, you know, I, I co-chaired with my colleague Ventura Rodriguez from um, Massachusetts Department of Education, who's, he's a deputy commissioner for the Center of Strategic Initiatives with a focus on engendering educational equity and we co-chaired the, the New England uh, Regional Task Force on Diversifying the Educator Workforce. And so we do have uh, those connections and, and, and a lot of that work through our, our consortium is looking at uh, leveraging regional solutions to issues related to educational equity and particularly you know, systemic racism, et cetera. That includes that sort of curriculum focus and looking at standards as well as data collection. So I would just wanna put forward that there is um, that work that is underway and has been ongoing um, since 2018, and that there are resources that are on the East Coast as well that we could be leveraging, whether it's in addition to, um, or you know, as an initial step that I would just wanna put forward. Also, when it comes to the, the survey, I would, and I know Amanda is, is already probably familiar with this, but in 2018, we had engaged in our Supporting Educational Equity Initiative in which we, uh, through the work of a consultant, um, worked with for about a year uh, educators of color, BIPOC populations, and, and women 
to surface recommendations from an educator perspective ar around how we could support educational equity um, and sy address systemic racism. And so I put a link there where there was recommendations directly from educators about what they would like to see. But again, to, to Representative James' question, I, I, I would just say that as an initial step and in knowing the funding that's available coming into the locals. And I, I, I don't know if these things are actually in conflict, but certainly through the connections that the uh, work group has with local communities and with local educators that you, you easily could put forward uh, and have folks engage in that professional learning or engage a, a consultant or expert using those local funds to consider to continue to leverage this work. And, and I just would say that that would be something worthy of consideration. Representative Conlon, and we're gonna to have to, we're probably, I know that we're probably gonna come back to this at some point, but we've got to move on to the, to the next uh, part of our agenda as well. Uh, Representative Conlon, please. Uh, thanks, um, hey, good morning, Mark, and good, good morning, Amanda. Nice to see you both again. Um, so. It, it, I'm trying to sort of bottom line this. What it sounds like is we've, we've got a, the, 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 that the task force has really sort of said, you know, we sort of know what the problem is and we know where we want to be, but we need the expertise to translate that into, frankly, a, um, uh, standards that are appropriate to present to the State Board of Education. It, would that be an accurate statement as to what you're trying to solve? And, and, and I will just add so we can wrap up quickly. Um, you know, the, the challenge we have with the money is yes, all the locals are awash in, in federal dollars, but how do you sort of grab little tiny bits and pieces here and there to help this organization have an appropriation to finish up what they need to do? But anyway, uh, if you could just sort of kind of help me bottom line the, the, the real problem, if I'm correct in my assessment. Thank you for the clarity of the question. <laughs> Mark, you want to give it a crack? Yeah, I, I think that pretty much hits the nail on the head. We need some extensive expert guidance in order to fulfill the mission of Act One and to provide all school districts with the kind of uh, support and consultation that they're going to need in the future when they begin to do this hard work in their communities with parents, with students, and others. So I think exactly. Representative Conlon, your, your question was very clear and I, and I think it is it speaks but, to the heart of why we're here today. But your role isn't really to, um, the, the last part of what you said in terms of you know, helping communities and families understand, I mean, the role of the task force is to recommend standards to the correct. State Board of Education. That's right, when, when you read our EQS recommendations, we put a lot of emphasis on the importance of local bodies teachers, staff, administrators, community members, doing the hard work at the local level. Our job is to give them the resources and, this, and, the, and the help that they're gonna need with these standards and also with the EQS so that they can be effective. But that work, you're correct, that has to be done locally. Thank you. And I, I think that, you know, it's, when it comes to equity, I know that Justice put the AOS literacy grants, but I think like the equity grants. But I think that, you know, we need to make sure that districts are ready. And I think with, with our work, um, like our, our work has always been the floor, right? Like all these things are happening, but like, because we're also going to be looking at the state board, at the district, some of the district policies that align with this work and what is happening. Some of the stories that we're hearing from, from for example, from that sheet that, we, that I sent you a couple of weeks ago, which was a role play that was happening in one of the districts. Um, that's because the systems are not in place and they're actually used when they reply to emails, they use the standards as the way that they were using those um, that curriculum piece, they were using it based on the, and they said, look, the standards let us do this. And so like the curriculum, the violence that is happening in, in, in some of the schools, at the same time, there's really beautiful work that is happening. Some teachers are doing really amazing things with their students. And 
um, even in these hard times, these conversations are happening by our teachers. They are doing really great work. Some of them are building ethnic studies units in their classes. Some of them are doing uh, work with students around bystanders and how to deal. Some of them are, you know, students in middle schools are learning about things that, that their minds are blown away because they finally see themselves represented. So I think we have beautiful things that are happening in the state. I think many of those teachers are really excited for this Act One working group and the possibilities that can happen. Some of these teachers are in systems that are not ready for them. So they're like also having a hard time. So here, you know, this is work of everybody. Um, and the reason why I push back and in, in like that, we really want the San Francisco folks is because they have the expertise, like two, like one of the best, uh, like 50 years of practice on around communities that we are advocating for um, that are really deep into like the life of the students that we want all students to be able to feel like that. So I think, um, again, we're not asking them to do the work, to guide us the work with their brain around ethnic studies and what that means for our state. Um, Amanda and Mark, just one thing that I'm hearing is, is I think that your task in this bill, this act one, you're, you're going a bit outside of what it's my understanding of what act one was wanting you to do. So, my, I guess my question for you is, should we stay focused on you know, the standards and then look at expanding the role of the group? Because some of what you're, at, you're talking about seems like it's an expanded role when you're well, starting to talk about yeah. that level of implementation. I think the teacher maybe is outside of the role, um, but like the, the teacher prep program, but the standards and all that, this is People talk about lanes. I'm like, this is our lane. Our lane is looking at those content standards. Our lane is looking at all those district policies that affect a student from performance. That is all our job to be able to do that. So that uh, maybe the teacher prep, yes, like this is because we're thinking implementation ahead. We're like, we need to kind of fill the systems, get the seats ready so that when these are ready, you know, like this prep can come. So no, the standards is our duty. Most of so the yeah, that, that's your your primary that's your yeah. primary thing that that we really want to help you to stay focused on that. At the same time, in terms of those other things, looking at the membership of your group, you've got the superintendents, the principals, the teachers. The, you've got a lot of people that can take these ideas, take them to their districts, and get that done. So that you've got a powerful group mm -hmm. uh, on this um, in terms of people inside government and people outside government. Correct. So, so I, 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 I wanna support you to, if we can get this first piece organized and maybe come back next year and we could look at the possibility of expanding some of the mission of the group um, if, that's, if that's appropriate um, is, is one of my thoughts. And then I wanna go to, to Jess. Um, uh, that's just, I was really, is that a new hand or an old hand? <laughs> Uh, it, was, it was a new hand, and and I I would just say because I, I know we we probably are running out of time is you know we're here you know anything we can do to support the group, um, and and I I would just say that you know I, I think everyone knows this and you know the the situation that Amanda was referencing is we are actually in this real storming phase we're we're seeing growth there has been focus on this for an extended period of time, but you know, change can happen slowly and then in these big jumps and then conflict arises. We've seen that over time and in history as you're trying to do this work that there can be these backlashes, uh, community responses that cause conflict and stress on systems. And I would just say that um, people are gonna make mistakes as they're doing this. You know, I, I think uh, if I'm remembering correctly with the particular issue, I think that Amanda was referencing, you know, that was someone trying to use Washington close-up curriculum that actually it's a, a, a long-standing program that's been pretty exceptional that really does focus on addressing issues and teaching students how to engage when there's um, fairly extreme uh, viewpoints and how do you sort of navigate that. And I think what we saw was there was an implementation error, right, of, of content um, that caused harm 
but in fact, actually, that was someone maybe trying to do well, but but perhaps making mistakes in implementation and thinking about how can we support systems who I think we've seen, you know, we had 12 SUSSDs uh, receive awards for our equity literacy grants in 2019. I'm hoping we're going to have uh, an equal output. And I think we're starting to see that movement, but it's it's messy, right? And, and mistakes are made. And any way that we can support, not just in looking at the, um, standards work, but knowing that implementation is something that we can help support as the agency, you know, we're standing ready and would love to do so. Representative Webb, if I may, part of the reason the implementation question has come up for us is because when we took a deep dive into the EQS, that document speaks to structures and systems, as well as principles and standards. However, you are correct. The foundation is the standards, which is why we really got to get it right. Everything in the future flows from that. And that's really why we're here today. And that's what we need you to do. We, we right. really need you to, to look at that, um, having been in education since the 1980. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> and it's only 65,000 we're asking. And I, can I just say, just to, to frame a little bit of those documents that that Jess was references, that's actually curricular violence when the way that they're talking and framing that it's not, it's not just about implementation. Like they're already using terms that they shouldn't be using. That's you know, like forcing a student to look at a deportation proceeding in a time like this, even for uh, particular education practices is curriculum violence. And a lot of students are impacted by the way that these things are framed. Even if you do it right, it's like, you cannot tell me that, you know, in slavery, a uh, role play, it's good. It, it, it's, it's an educational practice. It should not, it should not be. So I, I think this work is so important for so many levels talking and like, as a Latina woman of color, those documents are really hurtful just to like even think about the people in the work that I did um, with communities on the border, with students who were who have been deported. You know, like I, I think that there are we can have this deep dialogues and conversations and be against some of the policies, but be able to come out without hurting students. And students are hurting right now. So I think that it's important. I have to bring this to a close. <laughs> I'm yeah, so sorry. sorry. I just, um, Representative Austin, I'm going to have to ask you to wait. Um, and um, just, just to Carolis, did you have, is that? Yeah, I, I think I just wanted to clarify that, Yeah. you know, the difference between curriculum and instructional choices. And, and I, I agree, Amanda, I, like I think that the instructional choices that were made, including content that people were pulling was problematic. Um, so I, I guess I'll just leave it there. Okay, um, Representative Austin, can you can you do it in uh, twenty seconds? I can. Um, I just want to say that um, the Indigenous um, ask. I have recently been thinking that there should be an Indigenous person on every committee in the State House. Um, so I would totally support that. Okay. Thank you uh, very much. Um, it's an important conversation. We're trying to work our way through it. We've got loads of money coming in um, and using it strategically uh, certainly is, is a question of the hour. Um, so. Thank you for your time today. Appreciate thank you. It. Thank you so much. Thank you. We are interestingly going to move to S16, uh, which has to do with a task force on exclusionary discipline reform. Um, which is of interest, I think, to this group as well, since we, we have some statistics that are concerning in relationship to, to who, is, um, who, are, who is more likely to fall under exclusionary discipline. So I want to start with, we've got a lot of people here, um, quite a group. I actually wanted to start, I think, with, why don't, um, Mona, I'm gonna hold for you for a minute. I think I'd like to go to um, Dr. Chuck Myers from NFI and check in with you. 
Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to see you again. You certainly have, have spent some time talking to us related to trauma informed um, issues and schools and have worked at, at this closely in this area, certainly in our area. And S-16 is a bill that I think we sent to you and we're looking for your, we're looking for feedback from the people in this room as to what have we got right? What would you change? Um, you know, are, are there unintended consequences to what, what we have here? So if we could keep this focus there, that would be great. Um, so welcome, Dr. Myers. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you to the committee for um, uh, hearing uh, these issues. I'm very interested in the conversation we just left. Thank you for letting me sit on that. Uh, it's again, another really important piece of work. Uh, we've, uh, let me just uh, introduce myself. So I'm Dr. Chuck Myers. I'm executive director of NFI, uh, stands for Northeastern Family Institute. We are a designated service agency with the Department of Mental Health and also operate five or cooperate five independent schools. Um, our schools, which is the topic pertinent to the committee in this topic, um, are uh, schools that receive uh, referrals from local education agencies uh, to our schools. And most of our students are identified as having some learning difference. That means usually they're on an IEP and usually some pretty intensive behavioral issues. And um, what I wanna say uh, initially is that um, I'm gonna split my time uh, with uh, Kim Asim, who is uh, uh, on the screen now. Uh, Kim actually uh, supervises uh, four of our five schools. Um, she probably won't tell you, but I will, that uh, she has uh, come to NFI. She's worked at NFI for almost seven years now. And before that, had a long and uh, illustrious history with the Howard Center, uh, directing and supervising their school-based clinicians. So these are folks that are hired by the Community Mental Health Center to work directly in schools to support the mental health needs that schools identify along with her and her team. Um, so at NFI, she's uh, in charge of our schools in terms of the educational, uh, curricular, um, disciplinary uh, and administrative, budgetary and clinical uh, issues uh, for our schools. So I do wanna say that the, um, the, the focus of this particular task force is essential and I think needs to be considered in a, a little bit broader context that although we're talking about behaviors in the school that may result in exclusion um, or expulsion, some kind of disciplinary process at least, it's real important that we continue to include uh, families in the social context. So thus my appreciation for the prior conversation that people realize we're not just looking at a behavior in a school. And if we were to do uh, a, a very strict behavior analysis about many of the behaviors that are exhibited in schools, we would find that the ideology is probably not as much in the school as it is in the community and in the home. And what one of the things uh, that we have found very important in our schools that serve probably the, some of the most challenging students uh, in the state is, is uh, an awareness that the intergenerational, uh, the impact of intergenerational poverty is, uh, should not be overlooked or underestimated. That it's not uncommon for some of our students to be faced with an ethical dilemma of whether they do well in school and abandon their family or comply with some of the standards or norms that are their families, which is not to be successful in school. So uh, I, would, I just wanna say that behaviors are important and they represent lots of things. And it's important that we spend enough time with kids and that we support teachers and school staff to spend enough time with kids and families to sort out the ideology of behavior. But with that, I wanna turn over, if it's uh, appropriate. Uh, appropriate. Please. 
Thank you, because uh, Kim actually spends a lot of time with our schools and knows this work much more intimately than I do. So thank you, Kim, for making time. And she submitted documents also uh, that reflect her testimony. Thank you. <clears throat> Should we bring those documents up? Will this be part of the... Um, Kim, would, would you recommend that we be looking at the documents? I, it's it's just my my what I'm going to say basically. Okay. So if you're a multimodal learner and you want to read along while I speak, then please bring <laughs> it up. Otherwise, if you're okay. an auditory learner, then you can just listen. <laughs> okay. And my goal today was just to talk a little bit about what we do at NFI in our schools and how that promotes success for so many students. And thank you for this opportunity to speak to the committee today. As Chuck said, I'm the Regional Director of Schools and Clinical Programming for NFI Vermont. I also work for the Vermont Best Project, and you'll hear in a little while from Amy Wheeler Sutton, who is an integral member of that um, project. Um, and I also do some work around the SAMHSA grant project AWARE for implement installing actually an interconnected systems framework, which Amy will also speak to. So we'll listen to her brilliance in a little bit. In all of our schools, we focus on the importance of relationships and fostering a sense of membership and belonging through the utilization of something we call our overarching framework, the normative approach, which among many tenets promotes equity and reduces hierarchy. We provide a culture that promotes respect, integrity, active engagement and safety. The primary method of assisting students in recognizing the outcome of their behavioral challenges and choices that do not align with our school-wide expectations is a restorative approach. A community meeting format is used to provide opportunities for students with the assistance of their peers to reflect on their decisions, their choices, understand the potential harm it has done and repair harm through relevant, not punitive consequences. We focus on relationship repair, not rule violation. In addition, we utilize elements of positive behavior interventions and supports, PBIS, in order to provide positive feedback and reinforcement as a proactive method to prevent behavioral challenges. We also utilize multiple modalities of instruction that include movement to support regulated bodies and minds. Similar to instructional techniques, we differentiate our responses to students' stress behavior based on knowledge of the student's capacity to reflect and the safest place for the student to make repairs. And please note that I intentionally use the language of stress behavior, not misbehavior. If there is a significant concern that impacts the potential safety, we, we may ask for a crisis screening from our local DA or enlisted support of police. While it is rare, if an incident should occur that would require a student to be out of community, we, all, we would expedite a restorative process to welcome the student back into the community. We also understand that stress occurs in the physical and cultural environments, so therefore all involved in supporting student has responsibility to adapt and make changes to promote success and reduce triggers. Stress is community property. We're all responsible for each other's stress and our relationships moderate stress. Almost all of the students we have, we serve have intensive social, emotional, behavioral needs. So if you look at the triangle, all of our students are in that intensive range that, you know, one to five percent of kids who aren't successful in the public education domain. Um, and this is a result mostly of developmental trauma and yet we rarely, rarely engage in exclusionary practices. When you remove a student from the context in which they experience the stress behavior, you eliminate that opportunity for the student to practice more adaptive ways of managing their stress in the very environment in which it occurs. Any practice that has a student leave the classroom or learning environment reinforces marginalization and disenfranchisement an unfortunate template that many students who are subjected to exclusionary practices have. It reinforces their belief that I don't belong. In order for children to feel safe, adults need to feel safe. At NFI Vermont, we promote a culture of wellness through flexibility, through respect, appreciation, feedback, and validation of the important work that is done. This creates a culture and a contagion of wellness. In addition, we utilize a method of supervision that doesn't focus on hierarchy, rather it focuses on reflection. That allows our staff to be vulnerable, 
because of established safety in our relationships. And vulnerable, vulnerability is not self-indulgent. It's around creativity and it's, it fosters courageousness. The consequence of this practice is the ability for folks to push the pause button, avoid being reactive and stay regulated when faced with dysregulated students. In other words, they cortically modulate because we know in the wise words of Dr. Bruce Perry, a, a dysregulated adult can't regulate a dysregulated student. The culture that is created is one where feedback is welcome, either positive or constructive. We develop a second theory about students by changing our mindsets. And when we change our mindset, we change practice. This is an important element of workforce development. In other words, the way we see students is the way that they see themselves. So modeling resilience, restoring their challenges. So we foster a healthier sense of self and tolerating the rupture and repair of relationships to build relational endurance are critical features to ensuring that students stay connected to their school community so as to prevent exclusionary practices and tendencies. All of these ways of work are trauma informed and invite humanity into the daily challenges we all experience when working with students who are struggling and suffering. So my hope for the task force is that you will include the expertise of those who work in therapeutic day treatment schools because we're doing a good job. Think about systems change, including intentional wellness opportunities for staff throughout their days. Wellness is not an individual's responsibility alone. Organizations also have the responsibility for promoting wellness. Provide necessary resources and coaching to ensuring durability of change, including trauma-informed responsive training, reflective practices and supervision, and healthy forums in which adults can discharge their distress. Consider how to integrate practices and resources to ensure there is alignment versus the all too common experience educators have of initiative fatigue. Don't tell them it's initiative. And finally, reduce the tendency to engage in hierarchical dictates about what schools and staff must do and consider participatory decision-making. For example, how do we want to be together versus telling people how this is, we, this is how we will be together. Thank you. Thank you. Um, one of the, the points in uh, F-16 says that um, use of school discipline strategies um, vary widely throughout the state. Is that something you've observed as well? Yes, it is. Um, questions? If I, if I can just add one more thing to that. Um, I, I'm not promoting that the task force come up with a uniformity of practice necessarily because I believe very strongly that all schools have a unique culture and we have to be respectful of that culture and the context and culture in which they live, their communities, et cetera. However, I would promote, again, it's a workforce development issue and how do you tolerate the distress of students and not so that you're implicit biases aren't elicited and that you are able to, not to overuse a phrase, but push that pause button and really reflect on the distress that's occurring in the environment and engage in a healthy relational practice that promotes students staying in their educational environment. Thank you. Representative Conlon. Uh, thanks. Um, uh, I had I did step out for a second. I may have missed this. Uh, can I just get a baseline description of, of NFI when you talk about our schools? I'm not quite sure what that meant. And, and if your kind of if your testimony is kind of uh, focused on therapeutic uh, day programs, which is, which is something that you mentioned. I didn't hear the first part, Representative Conlon. You said I just I, I need kind of a, a baseline description of NFI when you refer to our schools? Are these schools that you work with or schools that you operate? Thank you. I'm sorry if I wasn't clear about that. So as Chuck indicated, we have five independent day treatment schools, four of which I oversee. Um, so they are um, administered by NFI Vermont. And while I have been um, for the last seven years involved in therapeutic day treatment schools, um, Prior to that, as Chuck mentioned, I was my work was um, providing 
um, supports and resources to public schools. So my lens is through the therapeutic school community right now, but I think the reason that it's important to consider that lens and consider that expertise is because of the high rate of success that we have in um, serving students who have intensive social emotional behavioral needs and the incredible high rate of um, success we have in returning students to their sending schools to be able to reintegrate into their, um, their communities. Does that help Representative Conlon? Thank you. You're welcome. Representative Austin. Yes. Thank you. Um, as a school counselor in Essex, I just want to say that I work with NFI often uh, with my students, and I really respect and appreciate the work you do. It's very helpful. Thank you. Um, my question is, and my concern is the lack of data. Um, you know, to get really good data, I think we're hampered by the fact that it could disclose a student's identity. Um, and I'm wondering what your thoughts are, because I, I think without good data, we can't really kind of target uh, where we need to put our resources. Right. Well, Representative Austin, I do recall working with you in the past, actually. I think I've done some trainings for you in the past as well, so it's nice to see you. Um, so I think there's ways to provide de-identifying data to respect the confidentiality of students. It doesn't necessarily have to be individualized, but it can be, um, you know, more uh, aggregate data. Um, I didn't. I was not prepared to share data today. I apologize for that. Um, in terms of specific data from our perspective at NFI Vermont, we could certainly outline um, the intervention strategies that we utilize and how that correlates with the success rate of students um, meeting their academic, behavioral, social, emotional goals, as well as the success rate how that correlates with them returning to their sending school. I can tell you in the seven years that I've been at NFI Vermont, I can count on one hand how many students have returned to their sending school and then come back to us. It's very, very few students out of the hundreds and hundreds of students that we serve. Thank you, that would be, that would be very helpful, thank you. You're welcome. Um, I wanna go on and if you can stay with us, we may have um, questions from the rest of the committee as we go forward. Uh, and I'm looking for my agenda down here. So we have, um, should we go to Amy Wheeler Sutton and then Jeff Boudreau? Sounds great. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair and the committee for allowing us the opportunity to be here today to provide testimony for S16. Uh, for the record, I'm Amy Wheeler Sutton, Training and Development Coordinator for the BEST Project. Um, and I do have a brief slideshow if I'm able to share my screen. Yes, Jesse, can you help? Yes, Amy, you should be all set. Okay. Okay, can you all see that? Yes, thank you. Okay, great. Uh, so alongside Sherry Schoenberg, I coordinate the BEST project, which is housed at the Center on Disability and Community Inclusion at the University of Vermont. And six, since 1996, the BEST project has been charged with supporting supervisory unions, uh, districts, and schools to increase their capacity to address the needs of students who are at risk of or who experience social emotional behavioral challenges. And our primary role has been to provide training, coaching, data support, and technical assistance around positive behavioral interventions and supports, as Kim mentioned, PBIS. Um, and for those of you who aren't familiar with PBIS, um, it is a sustainable, proactive, school-wide, multi-tiered framework approach, um, which is a lot of jargony kinds of words, but hopefully as myself and Jeff are talking, you'll kind of see what I mean by that. Um, and the main outcome um, is to improve social and academic success for all students by utilizing positive preventative evidence-based strategies, um, working as collaborative teams within a school and district and utilizing database decision-making. 
Um, so we're really looking at making systems change and addressing all students' social, emotional, behavioral learning and well-being um, in order to have an impact for all students in a school environment. Um, and some of the outcomes that schools that implement PBIS well are seeing um, are that school personnel are feeling more effective um, and they are seeing reduced exclusionary discipline practices, which is why we've um, asked to testify today around S16. Um, and uh, I will just say that um, PBIS is not a curriculum or kind of a one day professional development training event that someone would go to. Um, it really is a, a lifelong or as long as someone's in a school commitment to addressing students' social, emotional, behavioral learning um, and uh, a process of continuous improvement. Um, and we do currently have 164 schools in Vermont who are implementing PBIS to some level of fidelity. Um, and that varies across the state, um, as you were mentioning. Um, and uh, just one uh, data source that we wanted to provide um, is that each year we ask the Agency of Education for uh, data around students receiving out of school suspensions um, and which schools um, are uh, excluding at what rates. Um, so in uh, school year 2019, we identified 27 of our PBIS schools as exemplar schools. So that means uh, that they are implementing with fidelity and seeing both academic and behavioral success. Um, so those are kind of our shining star schools. Um, and for those schools, uh, they only 1.5, uh, sorry, 1.6% of their students uh, were excluded in the form of an out of school suspension. Um, for the rest of the PBIS schools in Vermont, um, who may be implementing to different levels of fidelity or just not meeting that exemplar level, 2.2% um, of their students received an out of school suspension. And then all other schools in Vermont who are not formally implementing PBIS um, excluded students, 3.5% uh, of students. Um, so we're able to see that when schools are able to implement PBIS with fidelity, uh, they are um, causing fewer of their students to have an out of school suspension. In our efforts to support PBIS in Vermont schools. Amy, just, have... just a question on your graph. Um, yeah. Is that, do we add N of 27 and an N of 124? Are those, th those are. Yeah, so that would be all of the, the PBIS schools in Vermont yeah. that we had data for. Um, and then the 138 is the, the rest of the schools in Vermont. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, so as Kim mentioned, uh, we really embrace and promote a restorative approach um, and are really embedding that into all of our professional development offerings for schools. Um, so helping schools think about how they can um, start from a place of strong relationships, um, ensuring meaningful engagement of their students in all the work that they do. Um, voluntary participation, which is in reference to if a student were involved in a, a behavioral incident, um, that they would never be forced to participate in a restorative approach, um, that they need to um, voluntarily engage in that. Um, and uh, engaging our students in participatory decision-making and our families. Um, I was a member of the coordination team for the contract from the Agency of Education in 2019 and 2020 uh, that ultimately formed the Restorative Approaches Collaborative. And as part of that work, we provided training and coaching to 10, um, either a school or SUSD team on restorative approaches. Um, and I linked the final report from that project in my written testimony, so you could um, review that. And I think Meg Porcella from the Agency of Education also reported on that. Um, I'm not sure if it was to this committee. Um, so as a result of that work, um, we feel poised to provide some feedback and input on this bill. Um, and I also just wanna say, I um, linked the Vermont PBIS annual report in the written testimony as well. The 2020 report was a little different than once in the past because of the pandemic, but um, all of them are available on our website. So as the um, legislature continues to review S16, we just have a few considerations for you to uh, look at. Um, the first is the goals and composition of the task force. 
So as many who testified um, in the Senate and I think also um, in the House Committee um, have mentioned, while improving accurate data collection and analysis is really critical, uh, we believe that this can happen simultaneously with the task force researching ways to affect change in the outcomes for students and developing clear recommendations. Um, so we really wanna make sure that that is a focus of the task force um, and it, it doesn't get too sidelined um, with just the data um, because uh, we really can't wait for the data. We know that currently schools in Vermont um, are suspending students or excluding students for low level subjective behaviors and at disproportionate rates. And as Carlin Finn um, from Voices for Vermont Children mentioned in her testimony, while the findings part of the bill mentions middle school and high school, we know that this really is a pre-K through 12 issue. Um, it's also important to note that if the task force is gonna be looking at data, um, the suspension, expulsion, and the truancy data, which is referenced in section seven, uh, are likely to be significantly skewed as a result of the pandemic for school years 20 and 21. Um, so that's just important to note that it's it might look like suspension and expulsion have really improved or that um, truancy referrals to the um, attorney general have really improved, but it's really just the context is so different during the pandemic. Um, and while there's language in the bill around eliminating expulsion for students under age eight, we really should be looking at reducing and eventually eliminating expulsion and suspension for all students, especially those under eight. Um, expulsion is a fairly rare occurrence, and I would argue to say is almost entirely based on danger or violence, which is what's mentioned in the bill is allowable. Um, so while it seems like a really lofty thing to say we're going to ban expulsion of students under eight, I would look I would want to look at the data and see how common that actually is and how often that's related to something other than for a, a dangerous behavior. Um, there's actually a bill currently in the Massachusetts legislature that is um, looking to prohibit or significantly limit the use of both suspension and expulsion in licensed early education and care programs. Um, there's also a consideration that the Disability Law Project mentioned in their testimony around informal suspension, such as when a student is sent home for the rest of the day, but not necessarily given an official suspension, or when students end up spending an entire day in something like a planning room, but are not given a formal in-school suspension. Um, so that's something that should be considered by the task force when re making recommendations around data collection. Um, and I just wanna draw attention to the importance of language. So in some of the testimony or from some of the legislators, the terms expulsion and exclusionary discipline have been used interchangeably, um, but exclusionary discipline is kind of the overarching and refers to any type of school disciplinary action that removes or excludes a student from their learning environment, um, encompassing suspension and expulsion. Expulsion, like I said, happens fairly rarely. Um, so I just wanna make sure that everyone's clear on that language. Um, and in terms of task force makeup, we encourage the addition of a special education director, as many have mentioned, and a school counselor, because both of those roles bring a critical lens that may not be represented elsewhere on the task force. Um, and that the secretary of education, when convening this task force, consider members from the BEST project um, and the Vermont Restorative Approaches Collaborative as possible task force members to be able to lend their expertise. And then just as the um, Vermont School Boards Association, VPA and VSA detailed, uh, Vermont schools have several established and emerging programs that already are reducing the occurrence of exclusionary discipline. And those programs should really be leveraged and further supported to improve fidelity of implementation and widespread use of those programs and initiatives so that we're not reinventing the wheel, um, such as multi-tiered systems of support, MTSS, social emotional learning, trauma-informed practices, PBIS, restorative justice, um, and we refer to it as restorative approaches, thinking of a really broad school-wide approach to that. Um, integrated mental health services. So as Kim mentioned, three Vermont LEAs are currently engaged in Project AWARE, which is an initiative that serves to establish interconnections between mental health and schools um, so that students are supported um, wherever they are in homes, schools, and communities. 
Um, and then reinvigorating the need for a well-vetted statewide school climate survey. Um, so 33 of our Vermont PBIS schools have completed school climate surveys that are directly linked to our project so far this year. Many other schools are also completing school climate surveys, and that's a critical piece of data that's being missed right now, I think, statewide. Um, implicit bias training so that uh, school staff are more equipped to deal with those kind of vulnerable decision points that Kim was talking about to be able to have the skills to recognize their bias in the moment um, and alternative methods of schooling um, when needed. Um, I think both legislators in the task force um, could think about this issue in terms of systems data and practices. So you can see the um, diagram on this slide, um, which is what we think of when we're training our PBIS schools. Um, so rather than just saying, you know, well, you should do restorative practices or you should have a social emotional learning curriculum to tackle this issue. It's really broader than that. Um, and uh, we need to think about what teaming infrastructure exists in the school at the systems level, what professional learning and coaching do, do school teams need, um, what's the priority um, for this work in the district, um, what data are they looking for to know that this is working, what practices do they want to put into place to, to support students, and to really narrow down those practices to just be implementing the ones that we know will be successful and will have the biggest impact. And then as Kim mentioned, um, school staff really need professional learning, um, coaching, wellness supports in order to be able to do this work. So rather than just saying, we're no longer going to suspend and exclude, school staff need skills to implement something instead of suspension and expulsion. Um, and many of those initiatives and programs I just mentioned would be a great place to start. And then lastly, I'll just say um, that data on seclusion and restraint should really be considered either by this task force or more closely by the Agency of Education. While it is separate from exclusionary discipline, um, so it should not be a disciplinary response, um, more information on how these two responses are used is necessary and reduction in seclusion and restraint should also be an ongoing goal of the state, the districts, and the schools. And I just had to, as a former journalism major, had to, to point out a little typo in the bill on page nine, line nine, seclusion is incorrectly written as inclusion. So a, a kind of confusing typo, um, but thank you so much for your consideration of these issues and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. I am gonna um, move on to, uh, uh, would, I know we would very much like to get, you know, actual, some specific language that would, could help us as we're moving forward. Um, I want to go to, I think we're going to Jeff Udrell. Yeah, hi, good morning, everybody. Um, I can't stress enough how important Amy's work is um, thank you, Amy, for all that you said. I, I definitely agree, and I agree with everything that Kim has said also. Uh, my name is Jeff Boudreau. I work at People's Academy Middle Level in Morrisville, Vermont. Um, so we are a public school in, in the state of Vermont, um, and we do use PBIS um, as our framework. Um, it's an excellent framework. We've used it for many years. Um, and I, my job specifically, I know climate coordinator is a little vague, but I, I do work with students and staff around stress behaviors. Um, daily. That's just uh, constantly doing that. And, and also the PBIS coordinator for our school. Um, so I only have a few things to say. It'll be really short. Um, I just wanted us to kind of uh, promote PBIS and say that what Amy is doing in, on the ground uh, is, is working. Um, and I have data uh, that I could probably pull up. But not right now. <laughs> I don't have anything ready. Um, but I do want to say that uh, the data helps our school focus on creating informed decisions. Um, and this is whole school, individual, staff or student, um, around the environment, around the location. Um, we can really drill down to whatever we need to kind of find where the trends are um, across time, things that we need to improve. Um, I use Swiss Daily, uh, which is their data program called Swiss. Um, and I report out many times a month to staff. Um, to our internal uh, committees. Um, it helps us track what interventions are successful or unsuccessful. It helps direct staff to look at the positives and what students are doing. Um, that's a really important part of PBIS for me. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a great framework to 
um, sometimes staff can get stuck on what students are doing wrong and it's a it's built into the system where we're reminding them to look at what's positive and to really focus and teach um, what they're doing is right and um, and to name that. Um, their professional learning opportunities um, cannot be undersold. Um, I think that's that's a huge part. I, I think the data is great, um, but the professional learning opportunities that they provide um, not only encourage staff but also administrators to attend. Uh, which is helping improve mindsets around exclusionary discipline. Um, in the bill, um, finding section one, number three says that exclusionary discipline is mostly used, is mostly for minor misconduct. Um, that's, that struck me. And I would uh, urge the task force to not only just look at the data, but potentially talking to principals, superintendents, um, and the staff members involved with making these exclusionary decisions. It's often not a teacher who's suspending. Um, I'm, I'm not sure that that's ever the case. Um, it's really important to talk to who's making the decisions, what kind of training they're getting, and where their mindset is at in terms of biases they may have. Or, or I, They're the backstop on the exclusionary discipline. So I just I feel like they're, they're a really important group to talk to. And, and like I said, there's usually only one or two um, staff members making that ultimate decision. Uh, and that's all I have. Thank you. Thanks. I appreciate, uh, appreciate hearing from, from the schools as well. Uh, so then we have um, Bernice and then Lance. Yes, good morning, everyone. Lance and I actually are gonna be partnering on our time together. So Great. We'll uh, and we um, are very grateful for the opportunity to be here to share some thoughts and perspectives and recommendations on the bill. And also, um, I was so grateful, we both are so grateful for the opportunity to listen in just to the, the tail end of the Act 1, because that work is so deeply connected to the primary prevention of exclusionary discipline. So I, I'm just happy to be listening in as a, a citizen of Vermont and a, and a researcher. Um, so uh, for the record, good morning. My name is Dr. Bernice Garnett and I'm an associate professor in the College of Education and Social Services at the University of Vermont. I have a master's and doctoral degree in public health, which is a discipline primary focused on the prevention of negative outcomes through environmental and structural changes to systems, policy, procedures, and programs. To date, most of my research has been on school climate, restorative practices, and school-based health promotion. Hey everyone, good morning. My name is Dr. Lance Smith. I'm also a professor in the College of Education and Social Services at the University of Vermont. I'm a former middle school teacher and school counselor, a representative Austin. It's good to see school counselors uh, representing the committee today. Uh, my research is primarily on issues of equity and consciousness, uh, anti-racism consciousness, anti-ableism consciousness within schools and in mental health settings. And I am one of those beneficent, well-intended white teachers that Amanda mentioned in the previous session, where in my best intentions in trying to help these our, our students in Vermont schools, I have also caused harm. And so that is a primary motivational factor for me in the community-based research that our team is doing here in Vermont. Yeah, so for the, the past five years, Lance and I have been leading a community-based participatory research team with fellow colleagues in our College of Education and Social Services at UVM, um, partnering very authentically with uh, the Burlington School District um, to build data gathering systems and structures that support the district-wide implementation of restorative practices. So in other words, we have spent years working side by side, arm in arm, implementing research protocols, gathering and analyzing data that connects directly to the heart of S16. How do we redress the hyper-representation of Vermont black and brown students and students with disabilities within the exclusionary discipline systems of Vermont schools. So therefore, our remarks today are, info are informed by our individual lived experiences, our professional identities, the peer-reviewed literature, and our community-based participatory research project with the Burlington School District. Our recommendations today are structured to inform both the language in the current bill and the work of the proposed task force. 
Yeah. So Representative Webb, you asked us, you know, what have you got right in S-16 and, uh, and what might be the unintended consequences? Well, something you got right that we want to affirm is the bold language that cites the exclusionary discipline disparities that are experienced by Vermont black and brown children, children with, with disabilities, English language learners. And as was mentioned in the previous session, we've known this for 20 years, but far too often we don't name it or we or we skirt around it. So well done with that. What we would like you to, what we invite you to consider is in addition to these, um, and in addition to language that names the disparities, we also need to name the root of the disparities. That's institutional racism and structural ableism. No data is gathered in a vacuum. No data is understood and analyzed devoid of the context. So if we're producing data that once again just displays more black and brown kids are suspended in schools, more kids with, with uh, uh, disabilities are sent out of the classroom, that can reinforce the age old stereotypes that these kids are just inherently problematic. So we invite this bill to name the root cause of institutional racism and structural ableism. Uh, Bernice? Yeah. So in a, just to name the, the, the peer review literature, because there are, there are states, there are researchers that are diving headfirst into the content of exclusionary discipline disparities. And so I just wanted to briefly cite a recent comprehensive review of exclusionary discipline disparities, right? That was done by Welsh and Little in 2018. Um, and two quotes that I want to name that are deeply connected to the heart of S16. One is the evidence suggests that discipline disparities may be explained more by the behavior of adults teachers and principals in school than by student misbehavior and further state to date interventions have given insufficient attention to issues of race and culture and a focus primarily on student misbehavior. There appears to be a preference for race neutral policies. The role of race should not be overlooked or under discussed in crafting solutions to the discipline dilemma. Therefore, we want to echo the findings from this article and call in the need for critically conscious school discipline policies and data collection systems, right? So transformative, anti-racist, trauma-informed, and equity-centered language is implicit in S16, but we need to make it explicit, both in the language of the bill and the creation and charge of the task force. So we affirm that valuable statewide data on school discipline is largely unavailable. We know this from our own work. <laughs> it's incomplete and it's not readily available to the communities that need it to inform decisions. So therefore, we want to name the critical importance of data ownership and ensuring that school communities have timely and transparent access to school and district level data on the continuum of factors that relate to school discipline outcomes. Power sharing is a central tenet of community-based participatory research. The type of research that Lance and I do with the Burlington or with the Burlington School District, right? We have seen the critical importance of timely return of data to schools, to teachers on the ground so they can actually use data to inform program implementation. How can this task force support a streamlined system for school communities to access, integrate, and act upon the current school discipline data and our reimagining of the data collection process? Yeah, so this, this S16, the, the, the heart of this is, is all about improving both the breadth and the depth of data that we're gathering across the state of Vermont on suspensions and expulsions in, in, in Vermont schools, right? So it's, it's outcome data that S16 is looking for. I wanna give you an analogy. In attempting to address the COVID-19 pandemic, and I don't for a minute want to invalidate the real, the, 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 the suffering and the lived experience of people who, 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 all of us who are going through that. But if in trying to deal with that pandemic, we only limited our data gathering efforts to the outcomes of, of the disease, right? The number of persons who contracted the disease, the number of persons who died, and we weren't simultaneously gathering data on the etiology of the disease, how it spread and factors that limit the spread, how successful would we be in interrupting and controlling this pandemic? When it comes to the pandemic of systemic racism and structural ableism in Vermont schools, we need to do the same thing. We need to simultaneously be gathering the outcome data that this that S16 is currently uh, asking for, but also data that will paint a picture uh, that of, of, of the causes of institutional racism and structural ableism within Vermont schools, and also will allow us to, to mitigate and engage in, in prevention. For example, for example, 
We need data that will help us understand how many black and brown students and students with disabilities have a sense of belonging in their schools because that's significant. Our research says that thus far, very few of those students do. We need to know how many black and brown students and students with disabilities in Vermont trust that when they raise issues of racism and ableism in class and they bring it to an, an educator, an adult, that they will be heard, they will be validated and that action uh, will be taken. Again, our research suggests that that happens far too often uh, 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 within Vermont schools. So what we're, what we're inviting the, 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 the committee to consider is not only having the language that gets at outcome data, but also intentionally gathering data that gets at the etiology and will allow us to mitigate and prevent institutional racism and, and structural ableism. And furthermore, on that point, specifically, student voice is largely absent from outcome data that's singularly focused on exclusion, suspension, and expulsion, right? And so we want to encourage, echoing uh, the comments made by Amy Wheeler Sutton and other testimonies, a focus on school climate data. And we wanted to share a couple specific examples from our own research with the Burlington School District to showcase and uplift the current efforts of local schools to try to measure school climate and how can we capitalize on the existing data structures that schools are doing to measure school climate at a state level to again focus on the continuum of factors that are related to discipline outcomes by uplifting strength-based approaches and focusing on belonging, attention, and authentic relationships. So for example, we administered a district-wide survey to the Burlington School District for students in grades three through 12 that was specifically focused on their experiences with restorative practices, but also largely about their, their relationship to their school community. We included items like, I feel my classroom contributions are ignored because of my race, ethnicity, disability, lack of money, English language learning status, LGBTQIA identity. I have a voice in helping create classroom behavioral expectations. And finally, there are adults here who care about what happens to me. Those are examples of three items on our student survey that are helping us uplift and center student voice related to, do they have a role in creating classroom behavioral expectations? Are they aware of what the behavioral expectations are? Which is the earlier trickle down um, necessary review of policies to ensure that students, teachers, staff, families are aware of our expectations and our current community, but also have a say in creating those expectations, right? Yeah, which is why Bernice and I were so uplifted to hear that as a part of the Act One work, you'll be adding uh, a uh, three students to the committee. Uh, our students that we work with hand in hand, arm in arm in the Burlington School District in this research are teaching us nothing about us without us is for us. So if you want to, uh, uh, Representative Austin, you were talking about uh, uh, good data. If you want to raise the response rates, train students in research methodology and in, in research ethics and unleash them to gather data within their school system around issues of race and ableism. I want to share you an example of student-led, student uh, gathered data here in the Burlington School, Drip, school District and one of our youth participatory action a research team. So the students wanted to investigate the experiences of racism within their middle school. And one point of data was this. This was a, 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 a quote from an eighth grader in their school. Whenever a black man is shot by the police, I come to school and all the teachers are acting like nothing happens. If they do mention it, all they say is, oh, that's so bad. I don't want to think about it. I, sh I think we should not ignore that. So that's an eighth grade student gathering data about the experience of another eighth grade student. And what they found is the frequency of colorblind uh, racism within their school. We've seen this throughout our data gathering efforts within the Burlington School District. So again, just to emphasize, in addition to gathering data on outcomes related to exclusionary uh, discipline, we invite us to gather that data in concert with data on student experiences um, in schools, specifically with regards to, to racism and ableism. Mm -hmm. And specifically, there's language in the bill that recommends the task force to change the type of data collected and the data collection process regarding suspensions and expulsures. And we energetically support that language. Uh, that, that was sort of um, 
created warm fuzziness in my heart. And so more specifically, we recommend the task force review school district discipline policies to examine the behaviors that warrant a suspension as determined by the school community and further explore the behavioral referral process and the school-based data collection procedures. Because the quality of the data you're looking at is informed by the quality, the input of the quality of the data. And that is in your, that's in your written testimony. Correct? Yeah, all of this is in your written testimony. Yeah, yeah, I know it's a lot. And I just want to briefly, uh, um, I want to echo what Amy has already said and what Kim has already said. Schools are experiencing e initiative overload. So whatever we're going to do to gather this data, we invite that to be integrated in the work that's already being done in schools to redress disparities and exclusionary uh, disciplines, such as restorative practices happening around the state, PBIS, multi-tiered systems of support, and, and, and social emotional learning um, initiatives. Let's not add something onto the plate. Let's, let's integrate this into what's already happening. Quite well taken. <laughs> um, we have just two more recommendations and we'll stop right now. And this echoes to the, the previous Act One uh, conversation yeah. related to being overmaxed and without substantial resources to do the work. And we are very worried about this happening with the task force. If this it's, is adding on to the plates of overextended professionals already, so we wanna call on the Vermont legislator to establish a grant program with a distinct RFP that will allow for targeted sustainable data, gather, data gathering analysis and dissemination efforts by experienced community-based researchers that will work alongside local school districts and the agency of education. Analysis of the school discipline data has to be considered in an intersectional lens. So we recognize the ways in which race, gender, poverty, disability, language intersect to create exclusionary discipline disparities. So Vermont is uniquely positioned to lead critical trauma-informed and equity-based school climate policies and data collection efforts. But is the task force structured what is needed to drastically overhaul this system? What other financially resourced and sustainable structures are needed to further reinforce and create action from the task force work? For example, what is the relationship between the proposed new task force and other existing working groups like the Vermont Hazing, Harassment and Bullying Prevention Council that I work on, the Vermont Racial Equity Advisory Panel, the Act One Working Group that was already referenced? How can we streamline the various state working groups to ensure that we're supporting each other works, right? While we appreciate the importance of creating this task force, what is more critical is that the work of this task force be embedded into the structure and database decision-making practices of all Vermont schools. We cannot as a state create a facade of action through the creation of a task force. Thank you, point well taken. Um, Representative Williams and then Conlon. Yes, hi, thank you. Um, my question focuses around schools that, uh, in the race aspect, schools that have just the one race, how do you fit them in? Uh, is that a part that doesn't come into play or, or, or at what level does it come into play? I mean, these are sadly unexposed, lots of times, students. What is yeah. your thought? Yeah, I would like to, to feel that if I can. So racism is an endemic uh, it's a pandemic public health issue that is that white students and white people and white parents and white children have an integral role to play. We would be doing not only BIPOC students harm in Vermont if extremely predominantly white schools were also not engaged in the ethnic studies curriculum that was mentioned in the task force. We would also be doing further harm to white students and to white families. So I have a five-year-old and I have, an, I have a 13-year-old. They are in an extremely predominantly white school. They are currently studying the uh, adolescent version of Eva Max Kendi stamped uh, from the beginning. And as white boys, they need to understand their own implicit bias. They need to understand their, their role in, in, in racism when often like their father, they're participating in racism and they don't even know it. So we would emphasize in the, and the literature supports this, that this, this, this work, the ethnic studies uh, curriculum is needed across Vermont. So, 
I'm a um, little bit, I'm watching the time right now. We're going to need to switch very soon. Um, and I also want to give the committee a, a, a 10 minute break. Um, so I, I just wanted to, be, before I go to any more questions, I just want to just check with Amanda Garces. Did she want to, did, Amanda, did you want to add something at this point or has it all been said? <laughs> I think it's all been said. Okay. I think, um, yes, I think everybody's great. Great. And Representative Brady, I'm going to be asking you to do some follow up here um, with this. This is this is our high school um, social studies teacher that we have in our committee room, which we're very fortunate to have. Um, so I wanted to to uh, Representative Arison and then Brady. We shut my video off so my voice doesn't sound all funny. First off, I'm not an educator. Uh, a, a basic question, okay, I decided to go to college and enter as, as an educator. When I get out of college, will my toolbox be have adequate uh, things in it to deal with all the problems we've talked about today? Uh, I realize that a lot of um, uh, what we're talking about are, are teachers, and, and there's an evolution when you become a teacher of continued learning on yourself. But does the green teacher have a toolbox that's good enough? So I, I think I'm hearing your question is, are our teachers prepared when they leave their undergraduate degree to advance and support and integrate and implement equity-centered pedagogical practices? Is that sort of your question? Exactly. <laughs> Okay, so I work at UVM in the College of Education and Social Services, which theoretically prepares, right, um, soon to be classroom teachers. So I'm mindful of the various positionalities I'm holding here. Um, but I would argue that my colleagues would be critical in this space too and question the level, at least in, at UVM, are we preparing, which is teach the, the pre-service teacher education workforce is predominantly white, predominantly female, right? Are we adequately preparing and engaging and challenging our students to, to embody and develop critical consciousness and self-awareness and the ways in which their own social position factors are going to show up explicitly, implicitly in the ways we teach. I don't know if we're there yet. We, we've had lots of conversations. Actually, Lance and I co-chair the Committee on Equity, Action, and Diversity in our college to try to do this exact work that we're talking about. There's pushback, there's resistance, there's white fragility, like there's all that stuff. So I don't think we, you ever arrive ever. And so I think that's a critical importance to realize too. practice humility, realize that you, that there's always more work to be done, particular and in preparing. So I don't, I don't know if I answered your question. Maybe no, is the simple answer. <laughs> And I'll just say, you know, we work with Brandy Simonson out of UConn around classroom management strategies for teachers. Um, and many of her pre-service teachers at UConn, you know, they might get one um, class that's focused on classroom management and behavior support. Um, and I think, you know, pre-service programs are probably trying to do better around including trauma-informed um, strategies and an equity-based work, but I think it's it's a work in progress, and the teachers that are arriving tomorrow in in classrooms are are not as prepared as we'd like them to be in this area. Well, I can say, in in terms of school counselors, uh, that's happening, and I'm and I'm being a little facetious, uh, facetious there. We are leaning into this work. We are experiencing pushback. I'm hearing from teachers and school counselors in the field that the younger generation is doing a much better job than people like me who entered teacher education in, in 1998. But absolutely, I echo what my colleague said. We have far more work to do. We've Oh, we've got to do better in the, in the, in, in the College of, of Education. I'm going to give us three more minutes. <laughs> um, and then we're, I'm going to give us a, a five minute break uh, because we have people in the waiting room. Um, so uh, Representative, Representative Brady. Thank you. Is there a sort of high school uh, level PBIS type curriculum. There's obviously trauma informed, but I'll admit that volunteering in my kids' elementary schools and seeing some really great PBIS implementation is some of the best training I ever did as a high school teacher. Um, and, and I haven't seen that framework so much 
at the high school level. Obviously, you're not going to give out little, you know, get, you know, the little uh, marbles each time, but, but a, a high school level kind of framework that is positive uh, reinforcement based. Does that structure or training exist and are high schools involved in it at all in our state? Yeah, um, so we have um, Fairhaven High School was recently trained. Um, uh, People's Academy is middle. Um, and we have a few other high school of uh, Regens was trained a long time ago. I'm not sure about their current status of implementation. Um, it really is context dependent. So it is a framework that can be altered to whatever the context is. Um, so like you said, you're not going to be giving some kind of, you know, fuzzy to a high school student. And so it's about drawing in that student voice of what is reinforcing to you? What do you want our school community to look like? And how do we build that together um, using the PBIS framework? And so if schools are hesitant because they think PBIS is for elementary school, you know, it's MTSS for behavior. So you're doing MTSS on the academic side. How are you building out those supports at the universal target and intensive levels for your behavior? And there's a lot of national um, exemplars in the um, high school area for PBIS. We have one more minute, Representative Conlon. All right, I'll give it my best shot. Um, the bill calls for the task force to compile, emphasize the word compile data, which to me says, look at data that exists. Uh, it sounds like you're advocating that the uh, task force collect data that doesn't exist. Um, Blanche, in particular, you said data that will paint a picture of the causes of institutional racism and structural ableism. I don't know that that data exists and I'm not sure that the task force is necessarily the best equipped to collect that data. So I'm gonna re re refer to my colleague, Bernice, but I would say yes. And if not us, then who? If we're not asking our black and brown students about their experiences of microaggressions in the classroom in Vermont, then we're not getting the data we need that will inform how institutional uh, racism is reinforced in Vermont. So if not us, and if not this task force at, at the statewide level, then who? Uh, Bernice? Yeah, Representative Colin, you're spot on, right? It's a both end. There, are, there aren't current standardized or um, supported statewide data systems that collect things like implicit bias, microaggression, critical consciousness, but we believe that there is an opportunity to reinvigorate the state level conversation about school climate assessment to be integrated into balanced accountability models of schools. I was part of a conversation several years ago about school climate at the state level. That should be a priority if we are wholeheartedly and authentically interested in reducing exclusionary discipline, we have to focus on climate. And so we can embed some of these questions related to implicit bias and student voice in school climate surveys. And this is already happening. Schools are already collecting school climate data. It's just not being integrated systematically to understand the relationship between school climate and outcomes. So it's not a far lift. It's just massaging language, creating streamlined processes and the agency of education, creating structures for school school climate data to be integrated. Okay, I'm gonna violate my one minute um, and give Representative Austin um, 15 seconds to ask her question. <laughs> my question is this, um, I'm just curious uh, about the role of working with families as partners with their children um, to, to work on their behavior and specifically to Lance and Bernice, the migrant community, we're gonna be getting hopefully more migrants, you know, uh, and my concern is the cultural and language uh, barricades, especially when they're integrating into the school, um, which might be cause for the, their children's behavior. Um, I, I think the questions, I think the yeah, question's the been question asked. How do we, it, I'm curious about families, but the migrant families where the children become the ones that have to speak uh, with the school system because the parent doesn't have the language. Um, how, how are you working on that? So we have a colleague, uh, Cynthia, uh, Cynthia uh, Reyes, who I believe is on the, the Act One Task Force. This is her area of expertise. She has uh, devoted her, uh, herself to this. So I invite us to reach out to her. 
And I'll say um, in Winooski, uh, JFK Elementary is a PBIS school. Um, so they've done a lot of work around how to engage all of their families and use, I believe they're called their cultural liaisons um, to do some of this work as well. So their cultural liaisons are a big part of their PBIS work. Thank you. And I'll just like to add, because S16 is so centrally focused on data collection, it's critical, it's absolutely critical that we evaluate language accessibility for student statewide and school-based surveys. For example, in the Burlington School District, we've spent two weeks now engaging with the Burlington School District's uh, cultural liaisons to tra audio translate our written English survey into the eight most commonly narrated languages in the school district. So we're not just collecting data on student voice from the white kids who can speak English and who can read English because without having data collection systems that are equitable and critically conscious, we're never gonna elevate student voice from our marginalized populations. And, and that's- yeah. And I'm going to have, I'm gonna have to stop. <laughs> I'm going to have to stop us. What, what I want to say is we are going to be, and it's passionate and I can feel the passion in this room and um, we are going to be marking up the bill next week. Um, and I'm going to be reaching out to uh, Representative Brady to, to help with that. And um, I can speak, we can talk a little bit later, Representative Brady, about that. But we obviously have some great resources here. And um, I would just ask that you, if you could be available um, for questions at that point, because I, I believe we're going to be trying to move this next week. And so we're now it's really the language. <laughs> we hear the concepts, now it's the language. Okay. And with that, I wanna thank you. Um, a really fabulous uh, conversation and how lucky we are to have these resources, resources here. And, and also so great to be uh, having this conversation follow our discussion about Act One. So uh, Representative Brady, did you have something? Well, the thing that we didn't get to that I do want to is drug, I want drugs, <laughs> um, you know, that so often at the high, at higher levels, high school level, expulsion, suspension, things is around substance abuse. And, and we haven't talked about that at all. So I'm, I'm just wondering as we move forward on the bill, is there anything missing? Is there a way to address? Um, I, I, I don't know, but Let's I'm concerned that, that we haven't dealt in that realm. Let's move that to mark up and maybe you could follow up yeah. with some of the experts in this room. Would be great. Yeah, so to let me know whoever, you know, is the best to reach out to on the substance abuse parts of our discipline policies. Yeah. Yeah, we have um, John Kidda on our team who's working okay. right now on restorative approaches to drug okay. um, issues in schools. Put me in touch. <laughs> yeah, yeah, great. Can you connect on that? Thank you. I'm going to, we are now a half an hour behind and I know we have people that are waiting to come in. I, I, can the committee take a five minute break? Is five minutes enough? Okay. We'll take a five minute break. We'll be back at uh, 1051. How's that sound? Um, and uh...